Welcome to Queensborough Community College. My name is Diane Call. I have the privilege of serving as interim president and an even greater privilege to welcome all of you to our spring 2012 presidential lecture series. This is um, a series that was created back in 2000. And what we do is in the fall, we have a distinguished presidential lecturer uh, who comes from the university, City University of New York, or is noted in the field, discipline that we all study here. And in the spring, we have the good fortune to have an amazing faculty who serve as wonderful resources. And in this case, of course, it's Dr. Edmund Klingen, who is our, our guest lecturer for the presidential series tonight. The purpose of the lecturers is to really establish an atmosphere um, <coughs> at our institution that, that stimulates discussion, thoughtfulness among the members of our faculty, our students, and the public, our community members. And certainly the goal is to raise the public and the college's uh, awareness of the issues that we face around us in this world today and of some of the amazing uh, areas of study in which our faculty participate. So our lectures showcase a distinguished professor or a national figure and we're very, very pleased that this semester, of course, in the spring, we feature our own. So welcome to all of you. And I know many of you are students. Students, you want to say hi? Students? Hi. There you are. Hi. That's good. Very good. We have members of our faculty here, members of our, our community who are faithful subscribers to this series. And we're also pleased to welcome Dr. Klingen's family here. Welcome. It's very nice to have you. I want to thank the Presidential Lecture Committee the members are here, uh, Dr. Amy Traver, Social Sciences, Dr. Sasan Karimi from Chemistry, who was also a presidential lecturer a couple of years ago, Dr. Mark Van Els from the History Department, uh, and Dr. Karen Steele, who is on her way to Baltimore, so she can't be with us. But we do welcome Dr. Edmund Klingen, who is uh, an associate professor in our history department, and he's going to address us on a very interesting shift in the world paradigm of economics, oil, credit, and the shifting balance of power. So you may have read in the uh, brochure that was sent out that the oil standard has replaced the gold standard in many respects, and its value has fueled unprecedented credit and economic growth around the world. Now, this can affect many things, and I think we'll hear a little bit more about how our lives are quite affected on a daily basis by these changes. So, Dr. Klingen will discuss the new balance of power, the transition to new energy systems, and how nations will deal with each. Now, he's quite accomplished, as our faculty are. Dr. Klingen earned his BA in history from Queens College, and his MA and PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He was a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Bonn in Germany, and then he went on to teach at the University of North Dakota. We've been fortunate that Dr. Klingen's been with us since 2004. He teaches courses on ancient civilization, medieval and early modern Europe, modern Western civilization, and modern economic history. I am always fascinated by the titles of uh, Dr. Klingen's publications. I confess I'm not all that conversant, but his publications include Finance from Kaiser to Fuhrer, Budget Politics in Germany, 1912 to 1934, The Lives of Han Luther, 1879 to 1962, and so many others. So I'm going to let him do the speaking now because he, I'm sure, will be a wonderful presidential lecturer. Again, my thanks to you, Dr. Klingen. Welcome. Thank you very much, President Call, and thanks to the Presidential Lecture Committee and to the, uh, the publicity office and all the technical staff, uh, especially Ronnie Weprin for uh, promoting this event. Very grateful for that. The balance of power has shifted before and is shifting again. 
The late 1880s, the United States passed the Chinese Empire to become the largest economy in the world. For a number of decades, the U.S. exercised dominance and even hegemony. By 1970, the global power structure had shifted to a multipolar world. Henry Kissinger recognized that the world was no longer bipolar in nature, that Western Europe and Japan could stand on an equal footing with the U.S. and the USSR, and that the People's Republic of China had ended its long slide. Now, China has essentially caught up, shifting the balance again. How this happened is related to oil and credit. In this lecture today, I will discuss the measurements of economic strength, the relation of economic size to global power. I'll explain how the economic issues of the past 40 years are more closely related to oil issues than many realize. Finally, I'll tie all of this briefly to the credit crisis and the current economic problems. An expanded version of this research will appear in my book uh, at the end of the year, uh, the tentative title of which is Twilight's Last Gleaming. Paul Kennedy published The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers in 1987. Kennedy's thesis was simple, and I quote, if too large a proportion of the state's resources is diverted from wealth creation and allocated instead to military purposes, then that is likely to lead to a weakening of national power over the long term. In the same way, if a state overextends itself strategically by, say, the conquest of extensive territories or the waging of costly wars, it runs the risk that the potential benefits from external expansion may be outweighed by the great expense of it all, a dilemma which becomes acute if the nation concerned has entered a period of relative economic decline. Kennedy showed how the great powers have risen and fallen over the past 500 years. Economic factors allow a country to build its political, military, and cultural power, but when the countries engage in imperial overstretch and devote too many resources to the military, it erodes their economy and brings down their political influence. In the conclusion of the book, Kennedy warned that both the Soviet Union and the United States faced decline. In a 1990 article, Joseph Nye criticized Kennedy as overly deterministic and suggested that the revolutions of 1989 would mark the beginning of a new American golden age. Kennedy's reply is worth quoting. Quote, with the Soviet threat now winding down, there is now a chance of concentrating resources upon America's own internal weaknesses, as both the revivalists and I propose. The difference between us is that I am somewhat more skeptical about the proposed reforms being implemented. In 20 years' time, which was really what the final chapter of the rise and fall of the great powers was about, it will be interesting to see how much revival or decline has taken place. Well, we have now passed the 20th anniversary of Kennedy's reply and can make a judgment. While the United States did have a revival of economic and political influence, the decline since 2000 you see here, has left it in the weakest international position since before the First World War. Chief measure that I use in this study is gross domestic product, GDP. This measures the output of a nation's population in a year. It is useful for accounting both in the level of economic development as well as the size of the population. Different countries measure GDP in different ways, and there's been enormous debate over the question of purchasing parity. When there are restrictions on currency exchange and on prices, it becomes necessary to estimate the value of different economic goods and services. 
in the studies done by Angus Madison for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and in similar estimates as calculated by the Conference Board and the University of Groningen, these numbers, especially for India and China, increasingly diverged from the estimates by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. If one accepted the latter's numbers, one would conclude that American hegemony still existed. I think it is indisputable whether one looks at the gravity exerted by China on the world economy, especially on prices of raw materials such as oil, or military affairs, or culture, or even sports, that the American hegemony is gone. In 2009, China's energy consumption surpassed that of the United States. The debate over the economic size of China reached a crisis point in 2006. Opinion sharply divided at that point between two groups of scholars. The fundamental question was, did one believe, as the CIA did at the time and the OECD, that per capita GDP in China was about $6,800? Or was the number closer to $1,966, as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank believed? The lower number was a straight conversion of the Chinese economic figures using yuan even though the Chinese currency did not have full convertibility. The higher number already reflected adjustments made based on the assumptions that some reports were falsified. Angus Madison cut down the rate of growth from what is claimed by official Chinese sources by 11%. At the time, there were no middle numbers. I came to support the position of rich China in 2004, when China showed the ability to buy every drop of new oil that came onto the market. Externalities could prove the case. Did China resemble one of the poorer nations, as in the right-hand column here? or one of the middling nations, as seen in the left-hand column. If one believed in 2006 that per capita GDP in China resembled that of Haiti and the nations on the right-hand list, then one supported the World Bank and IMF. If one believed that it resembled that of, say, the Dominican Republic and the nations on the left-hand list, then one supported the OECD and the CIA. Now, the conference board has taken over responsibility for the estimates from the University of Groningen in what is called the Total Economy Database. And as its numbers for Chinese GDP approach those of the United States, uh, the conference board steadily began to whittle it down. Um, even as rich China was being whittled down a little bit, the IMF and World Bank abandoned their ridiculous figures. Rather than accepting the artificial currency figures, they announced they would use a purchasing parity power that the World Bank had completed. They finally admitted that China had become the second largest economy. The CIA Factbook, which had estimated the 2006 Chinese economy at $10 trillion, cut the 2007 estimate to about $7 trillion. So the CIA brought it down. The Total Econ Economy Database, or TED, TED, the TED's downward revisions reached the breaking point with the 2010 release. 
it had extended its historical adjustment back to the 1970s to suggest that at that time, China's per capita GDP was lower than that of Cambodia. To remind some of you who don't know or don't remember, Cambodia of the 1970s sandwiched Pol Pot's genocide between two wars against the United States and Vietnam. It is highly unlikely that, that this beleaguered country was richer than China in the 1970s. With the 2011 release, the TED began to throw in the towel. By one price parity adjustment, China's economy was now larger than that of the United States. It seems, in fact, that the figures are converging. As both sides try to avoid the conclusion, uh, China is about to become the world's premier economic power or is close enough that it's within the margin of error. The TED description uh, of China's economy being about the same as the United States put the per capita GDP uh, as equivalent roughly to these nations in the left-hand side. Again, the CIA and IMF figures on the right hand. Not so stark a difference as in 2006. Uh, some will dispute this. In his recent book, Robert Kagan dug out some obsolete numbers from the Agriculture Department's website to claim that the US still had the same share of global GDP that it has had for the last 40 years. This is willful ignorance, since Kagan shows elsewhere in the book that he's aware of better sources. This figure shows two indices that I have developed to show global influence based on comparative GDP. You can see the rise of American power after it became the leading economy in the world in the 1880s until the drastic fallback in the Great Depression. I got my little dot of light. I don't know how visible that is, but uh, you can see the impact of the Great Depression on these leadership figures. After World War II, the US briefly increased its lead, but suffered, suffered sharp declines associated with the Korean War, which you see here, and the Vietnam War which you see here. There was stability from the 1970s to 2000 with a small uptick from the revolutions of 1989 and the end of the Soviet Union. That you see up here. After 2000 came a free fall. A similar figure is the share of world GDP. Uh, the US is now at 18%, which is the lowest level it has had since 2005. Excuse, pardon me, since 1905. Energy has driven the unprecedented growth that sets the modern economy apart from the ancient and medieval economies. England was aided by its ability to support twice as much horsepower as France, back when horsepower meant horses. Peat burning powered development in the Netherlands. Then came the change from wood burning to coal burning that was a basic shift of the Industrial Revolution. The combination of oil and the internal combustion engine that appeared in the 20th century was even more intensive. The American ability to export unlimited amounts of oil was a key to victory in World War II. 
had the Japanese destroyed the fuel tanks at Pearl Harbor and left the ships alone, they would have dealt a far more crippling blow. The US was a net exporter of oil until 1948, and then the world's leading producer. The shift in the balance of global oil production helped lead to the multipolar world that developed by the 1970s. The first shock wave to hit the US economy was when American oil production peaked in 1970. And even the advent of production in Alaska could not restore that peak. You see here an all-time peak of almost 10 million barrels a day produced. We may say a bumpy plateau of about 17 years and then a steady fall. Not coincidentally, 1970 also marks the peak in American real wages and in individual median income. Household income has only risen modestly in this time because of second incomes. You see that reflected in the participation rates in the workforce. What increase there has been in median household income has been from the increased participation of women in the workforce. Now, after the price of oil began to rise substantially in 2000, there was strong incentive to produce more. From 2000 to 2005, global production rose 9%, as one would expect with rising prices and increasing incentive to bring marginal sources of oil online. In 2005 alone, global oil production rose 2.5% as Chinese demand skyrocketed. Then the system broke as oil production peaked. This was more serious because some of the largest exporters, such as Saudi Arabia and Russia, needed more oil for their own needs. So if by 2010 there was a 12 million barrel a day gap between the trend and what was actually being produced, it was worse when you consider global net exports. The trend would put it about 16 million barrels above what the global market of exports actually has. Former exporters such as Britain and Indonesia have become net importers. The pool of exportable oil and oil-like liquids contracted. To continue trend growth required oil production and export growth that simply did not happen. Finally, the Chinese in particular were able to use their enormous trade surplus accounts to buy up all the oil they needed leaving shortages for other nations. To a lesser degree, India also used its current account surpluses. By 2009, the export oil market had shrunk while the share taken by China and India had risen from 11% to 17%. The importance of oil to the American economy can also be shown here. This is total American energy consumption as measured by BTUs, that is energy content. 
and you can see that petroleum continues to dominate here. So what happens to oil is going to make quite a difference to what happens to the American economy. Most of this petroleum is used in transportation. The peak of 2006 and the move to a bumpy plateau constituted a second shock wave. The American economy came under increasing strain and the weakest parts, the housing market and the financial system, broke when the oil price doubled again. Now, this figure indicates the total miles driven by Americans and that that peaked in November of 2007 and has not recovered. But this chart doesn't quite give the full picture. If we account for the growth of population and we look at per capita miles driven, the effect is more stark, that it is down almost 7%. And in fact, on a per capita basis, Americans are driving the amount they were 15 years ago, January 1997. This relates also to the housing crisis because of tighter credit, which I'll address in a few minutes. Do you have to consider that there were families that bought houses that were long drives from their jobs, from their shopping? High gasoline prices made this lifestyle unsustainable for some. The worst hit areas in this crisis have been suburbs and even more the so-called exurbs. As developments emptied out, their very emptiness deterred potential buyers and accelerated their, their slide into shrubberbs, haunted by squatters and thieves stripping houses of valuable pipes and wires. The California counties with the highest foreclosure rates are those that had become exurbs of San Francisco and Los Angeles. In 2011, population grew more in Bronx County than in Nassau County. When is the last time that happened? The drop in vehicle miles driven is even more stark if we just look at 16 to 34 year olds. Since 2001, their per capita miles driven is down 23%. This reflects not only the high price of gas, but also the relative unavailability of cheap used cars. Historically, the average age of an active American vehicle was seven years. Recently, it has crept over 10 years. When people could not afford new cars and retained their older cars, it broke the chain, which had allowed 18 to 25 year olds to buy starter cars. Now, in the last 12 months, the sale of new cars has skyrocketed to levels that, frankly, I never expected to see again. We'll see if this revives youthful driving. The silver lining to this is that the U.S. is importing much less oil. As the chart indicates, we have cut our oil imports almost in half. Now, some of you may have read articles. One week ago, the New York Times had a whole lovely section. Fuel to burn. All this nice color, lovely, sponsored by General Electric and Conoco. All of this, not a single number like any uh, that I've presented to you today. 
There seems to be almost a concerted attempt to assure the public that all is right or could be right with oil. These articles are deeply misleading, either by conflation, omission, or outright errors. It is true that when the cost of oil approached $100 a barrel, new sources became economical, such as the tar sands in Canada. Since 2009, the number of oil rigs in the United States has increased sixfold. Many of these use hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling to extract so-called tight oil. These techniques are not new, as the media would have it. They were developed 35 years ago. Only now have tight oil formations, such as the Bakken Shale in North Dakota, become economical to drill. Let's look again at the Energy Department's chart to see the result of this 500% growth in rigs. Well, it has generated a 15%, 1,5% growth in U.S. oil production. Despite this enormous investment and the incentive of higher prices, it has barely balanced the decline in other sources. The government's estimate here, the projections into the future, also does not take account of the planned termination of the Alaska pipeline. Conflation is the mixing of high energy crude oil with lesser liquids such as natural gas condensate and ethanol. These other forms not only contain less energy by volume, and they also require more energy to be invested. So they may have a lower energy return on energy invested ratio. E-R-O-E-I for the infelicitous eroi. Ethanol, by one measure, yields only 50% more energy than the energy invested. Compare this to the estimates of early oil drilling, where that yield would have been 10,000%. Ethanol production has increased enormously. And when you have measures that talk about all liquids, ethanol gets counted as completely equal to oil. Since 2000, the United States has more than tripled its production of ethanol fuel. Now, as the Agriculture Department chart shows, we have reached diminishing returns. There is only so much corn out there and other organic sources that can be converted to ethanol. Ethanol production has had other unintended consequences. Putting food into the gas tank? What could go wrong? Well, not only did the price of corn rise to a level not seen for decades, the demand for wheat caused its price to rise, as well as meat prices. The price of corn tripled, the price of wheat doubled, the price of beef rose by 50%. Some of the leading importers of grain are poor nations. Egypt, is the leading importer of wheat in the world by a large margin and is the fourth ranked global importer of corn. Much of the unrest there was driven by food issues. To avoid riots, governments heavily subsidize food prices, which leads to other economic problems. We will not see another tripling of ethanol fuel. Then there is conflation of all fossil fuels. 
mixing the liquids with natural gas and coal. There are several problems here. Not only do these sources have different energy contents, but coal's energy content varies wildly from anthracite to lignite. If anyone has estimated the total remaining energy content of American coal, it remains a secret. We know that the average quality of coal mined has declined for many years. As quality gets lower, coal mining becomes more costly and damaging to the environment. There is only one Sinfuel plant uh, left in the United States, located in Beulah, North Dakota, that could convert coal to oil. A major shift to transport run on natural gas would require a new fueling infrastructure and a new vehicle fleet. The slow move to electric and hybrid cars and the apparently indestructible appeal of the pickup truck show how unlikely this is. Then there is gullibility. Gullibility shown by reference that global oil reserves are growing enormously. Most of these supposedly growing reserves are in three nations, Iraq, Iran, and Saudi Arabia. None of these three countries have had their reserves audited. Iraq and Iran have played leapfrog for decades. One announces it has more reserves. The other revises its figures to jump ahead. And then the other adjusts it, its reserves. There is little evidence that these reserves are real. Saudi Arabia is also an interesting case. Saudi Arabia regularly announces that despite pumping more than 3 billion barrels of oil a year for many years, its reserves have not fallen a bit. An absolutely straight line. Where's my dot? There it goes. 264 billion barrels. Every year they take out 3 billion and they magically refill to precisely the same amount. To look at another estimate, uh, which has to uh, extrapolate from when there was auditing back in the 1980s, Sam Foucher uh, makes the assumption that the ultimately recoverable reserve is 224 billion barrels. Um, Saudi Arabia, by this estimate, will stop exporting oil around 2040. That likely marks the effective end of the export market and will be the third oil shock wave. Finally, there's outright error. Statements are thrown around such as, oh, the United States alone has 100 years of oil supplies. This assertion assumes that kerogen, common in the Rocky Mountains, is oil. It is not. It is an oil precursor. It must be mined like coal, then crushed and heated at about 8,000 degrees. In the 1970s, oil companies explored kerogen and found that not only is production too expensive, but production consumes more energy than is yielded. In other words, its ROI is under one. May 2nd, 1982 is still remembered in Northwest Colorado as Black Sunday when Exxon announced it was abandoning its Carrigen project. Carrigen has no price point and will not contribute to the oil supply in my lifetime. A similar error is the transformation of net oil product exporter to mean the same as net oil exporter. As you saw on the earlier chart, the United States remains a net oil importer. The collapse of domestic demand for gasoline and other products has led refineries to import oil to keep operating and then shipping those products abroad. 
This will not last for much longer. Conoco and Sunoco are closing three refineries in the Philadelphia area, and others will follow as there's no need for them and profit margins are low. It is becoming clear that cheap oil will never return. What is the real value of oil? One barrel of oil contains the energy equivalent of 12,000 people working for one hour. If you paid them minimum wage, that would be about $84,000. So at $120 a barrel, oil is cheap. A cup of gasoline today costs less than a cup of coffee at McDonald's. Here is a paradox. We think of oil as expensive, but it is cheap relative to its real value. U.S. gas prices might go someday to $10 a gallon, but people will figure out ways to cope. When I was in Cairo 18 months ago, I was astonished by the traffic and the ways people lived with expensive gas. Hold on to cars for 40 years. Stuff every vehicle full of, of as much humanity as physically possible. Invent six lanes on a four-lane highway. <laughs> Have the government subsidize cheaper fuel. The cars and roads are not going to disappear. Everything will just get a little shabbier. Oil is indispensable because of its abundance, its concentrated energy, and its versatility. Other energy sources are poor substitutes. Hardship, at least for the moment, will be seen in the marginal and impoverished areas of the world. The biggest impact of oil is on the credit supply. If I may be allowed to venture for a few minutes into the theoretical. Critics often claim that credit is built on nothing. Some would even say, move to a credit-free society. Well, credit built this modern economic world. It is energy that gives value to this credit. The peat of the Netherlands, the coal of England, and then oil allowed for the massive expansion of the world economy. When that $84,000 barrel of oil is consumed, I don't think that value is entirely destroyed. At least part of the value lives on in the value of what it was burned for. And I also suspect that there is, let us say, a surplus commodity value that can be drawn upon as credit. The enormous and excessive volume of credit starting in World War I and the 1920s coincided with the marriage of oil and the internal combustion engine. Not by chance. The world left the gold standard after 1930 when it was too confining to economic growth. We substituted an oil standard, even if treaties did not fix values as the gold standard did. For 80 years, the growth in oil production allowed for stupendous growth in credit and unprecedented economic and population growth. Credit availability was often abused in this period, and it became the most visible symbol of our current crisis. From 2001 to 2004, the average federal funds rate set by the Federal Reserve was 66% lower than the 10-year rate, suggesting that the Fed had diverged sharply from market rates to pump credit into the economy. The housing market was a clear beneficiary, even though the economy as a whole hardly grew. 
Housing prices had traditionally kept pace with income and rents. Now an enormous bubble grew. When the Fed started to hike interest rates after November 2004, this hurt homeowners who had financed their mortgage with adjustable interest rates or had expected to refinance with lower interest rates. The crisis of 2008 was concentrated in the larger banks, especially those that did not take advantage of the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933 and remained mostly commercial or investment based. Let us be clear, Glass-Steagall would not have saved Bear Stearns. Glass-Steagall would not have saved Wachovia. Glass-Steagall would not have saved Merrill Lynch. Glass-Steagall would not have saved Washington Mutual. Glass-Steagall would not have saved Lehman Brothers. These banks made a growing percentage of their profits from collateralizing debt obligations. CDO. A financial institution would bundle loans, most notoriously mortgages, and sell bonds equal to the value of the bundle. In theory, the bundle would contain enough high quality loans to compensate for any loans that defaulted, as long as housing prices kept rising. These bonds could be sold to other institutions or themselves be collateralized in another bundle. The true value of these bundles was thus obscured and a value put on them dictated either by a model that always assumed a rising value of real estate, mark to model, or by established market prices for similar bundles, mark to market. Like any security, its value was only what someone was willing to pay for it, not any underlying value. The brief outline of the 2008 crisis should be familiar. The year opened with Bank of America taking over Countrywide Financial, a company that had been very aggressive in creating mortgages of dubious value. BOA thought it was getting a bargain because it was buying countrywide at one-third of its stated net worth. Some observers suspected that the Fed had brokered this deal after Moody's downgraded many of countrywide CDOs. The Fed steadily announced new swap programs with larger amounts and easier terms of collateral. Bear Stearns failed and was taken over by Chase. The Fed openly brokered this deal and assumed $29 billion in troubled assets. Over the summer, anxiety grew. A list of zombie banks circulated on the internet. All of those banks are today gone or taken over. In July, William Poole, retired head of the St. Louis Federal Reserve, said that the government-sponsored housing enterprises Freddie Mac and Fannie Mac May were insolvent. The turning point, though few realized it, came on July 29, 2008. Merrill Lynch, desperate to raise capital, announced it was selling so-called, deep breath here, <clears throat> U.S. super senior asset-backed security collateralized debt obligations. These had a gross notional value of $31 billion, but Merrill had valued them at $11 billion, that is 36 cents on the dollar. Their rating was AAA, the highest possible. Merrill sold these bonds to an affiliate of Lone Star Funds for $7 billion, that is 22 cents on the dollar. However, analysts scrutinizing the deal quickly realized that Merrill was sending cash along with the bonds, so that the bonds were actually valued at five and a half cents on the dollar. This sent shockwaves along Wall Street. As long as virtually no bundles were being sold, the banks could cling to the fantasy of mark to model and claim them at 80 cents or 60 cents or 36 cents. 
Now there was a sale made, a real market had been established, and all firms would be compelled to follow the market by accounting rules. Revaluing all the AAA troubled assets at five and a half cents would make most, if not all, of the major banks insolvent. September 2008, of course, was the climax. The government put Fannie and Freddie into conservatorship. The Fed massively expanded its programs and brokered another deal for Bank of America to take over Merrill Lynch. Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. The Fed invoked emergency powers to provide the insurer AIG with $85 billion. Chase took WAMU in another brokered deal. Citigroup thought it had acquired Wachovia, but the Fed gave it to Wells Fargo instead. The Treasury Department guaranteed $3.5 trillion in money market deposits. Mitsubishi UFJ bought 21% of Morgan Stanley. The credit market almost entirely froze until Congress passed the Troubled Assets Relief Program, TARP which committed $700 billion to the Treasury Department. The Fed, over the next year, swapped for $624 billion of mortgage-backed securities at face value while increasing its overall balance by a trillion dollars. The financial institutions had little interest in selling their troubled assets to the Treasury at what could be deep discounts. The shock caused a massive rise in joblessness. This chart compares participation rates and their divergence for, from full employment. Uh, this is a measure I've developed so that we can compare unemployment in different countries because every country has its own way of measuring unemployment. This way of measuring, not perfect, but it gives us a sense. And you, what you can see here is that in the first stage of the long emergence, say, uh, Iceland, Ireland, the United States saw massive layoffs from the crisis of the shadow banking system. You can see how they went from virtually full employment to substantial rates of unemployment. Then the second stage shows the devastation caused by foolish austerity policies in Greece, Spain, and again, Ireland. Conclusion. Oil, credit, the shifting balance of power will influence each other in changing and unpredictable ways. Gross domestic product is not the sole determinant of diplomatic or military power. GDP per capita is just as important because, as Mark Harrison said, the experience of two world wars has shown that when poor countries are subjected to massive attack, regardless of size, their economies tend to disintegrate, unquote. In World War I, Britain did better than Germany or Russia because its per capita GDP was higher, despite its small territory and a comparable size of GDP. According to Harrison, this allowed Britain, quote, to supply its war effort with resources of superior quantity and quality, and at the same time maintained its civilian households in better shape from the point of view of personal health, living standards, and morale, unquote. It seems likely that China will soon fall back. Rapid economic expansion brings a host of social and economic problems that a nation must accommodate. China's crony capitalism, environmental degradation, economic controls, local overdevelopment, and political opacity are all dangerous conditions. Its very success can contain the seeds of recession. As oil grows more expensive, the American consumer cannot buy as many goods from China. 
Many of these goods are discretionary. Oil also increases the transport costs. These trends have already led to a modest revival of American manufacturing. The Chinese trade surplus has diminished and in some months disappeared entirely. This in turn means that China has a lower cash reserve to buy oil. This puts downward pressure on the price of oil. Creating more American desire to buy Chinese discretionary goods, increasing the Chinese trade surplus, and allowing them to bid up the price of oil. We have already gone through one or two of these cycles and may go through more. Two years ago, the distinguished economic historian Robert Fogel estimated that by 2040, China's economy would be three times larger than that of the US. I think he is almost certainly wrong in this. The last time global economic leadership changed hands was in the 1880s when it went from China to the US. For various reasons, it was not noticed, not very important. Um, to try to find some kind of parallel, we could look at 19th century Europe. At the beginning of the century, France was the leading economy. We don't have anything like adequate economic numbers, but it seems clear that by the time of Napoleon, the French gained a dominance in Europe that could only be overthrown by the combined efforts of the other four great powers. The French Empire that included the Low Countries, the Rhineland, and Northern Italy may have been very close to a European hegemon. France was defeated by Britain and the other great powers. Britain, with the Industrial Revolution, became the largest economy in Europe. Not all that much larger, however, than the others, even at its peak in 1870. Britain also declined, in part because of careless diplomacy after 1865. The territories Britain acquired between 1865 and 1900 were mostly economically unproductive, and even running an empire on the cheap, they cost the British money. Britain failed to invest in education. In 1840, half or more of the men living in eight of the 44 counties of England and Wales could not sign their name in the marriage register. Even in 1896, only one half of 1% 1 of British children reached secondary education. Britain began to run a trade deficit in 1907, mainly because the government would neither subsidize agriculture nor would it consider trade barriers. Uh, Britain failed to move into commercial agriculture, as Denmark did at this time. It resorted to building up the Royal Navy, and all that did was spark an arms race. Britain was passed by Germany and then Russia in total GDP. To be very deterministic and reductionist, one could see the history of the 20th century as a long struggle for dominance among Britain, Germany, and Russia. The Germans emerged triumphant at the close of the century, but despite the wars, not because of them. Now, the passing of dominance in Europe around 1820, marked by the Napoleonic Wars, around 1910, marked by World War I, that certainly is a bad omen. But it doesn't have to be some kind of political law. There's no natural source of conflict between China and the United States. Since the long emergency began, we have rationed gasoline and electricity, not by government order, but by price. Total oil use in the US has fallen by 10% 
mostly as we've seen in transportation. The percentage of the American population holding a job is barely above the level of 1969, and real wages are stuck at the 1970 level. What recovery there has been has been concentrated overwhelmingly in the richer classes. Millions have been pushed out of the labor force. No wonder so many people are angry. In conclusion, money and credit still exist for this country. Japan's national debt as a ratio of its economy is twice that of the United States. And its interest rates are low as our interest rate rates are low. This suggests that the US could fund a dozen programs of the size of the 2009 Obama Jobs Act. One needs to focus spending on making a fair and orderly transition to a new energy regime, using less oil more efficiently. A peacetime military budget would correct debt and trade problems. There must be focus on increasing productivity by modernizing transportation, improving education, bringing American health care results to the level of the other developed nations. Increased productivity can compensate for a stagnating energy supply to provide a measure of growth. Complacency is the biggest enemy. As long as we understand we're in a long emergency, don't do anything stupid, we'll be all right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Klingen. Would we could take some questions at this time? Questions? Yes, sir. Yes, um, to close with this sort of message that we need to improve infrastructure and so on, but I'm sure you would have something to say about factors that have opposed this historically and continue to oppose this necessary transition that we, we need. Well, I mean, as a historian, and in the book that should be out at the end of this year, I have a chapter on the historical development of the United States and these factors, and the ongoing forces. There are obstructionist forces that exist back to the 1820s. I hesitate in the presence of my colleagues in U.S. history. I saw Professor Elias here as well. Yes, there she is. Uh, but there, there were these forces that opposed uh, government-funded road systems, turnpikes back in the 1820s. There were obstructionist forces uh, delaying railroad development. Uh, in part, this is what the Civil War uh, solved for a, for a while. Uh, but yes, those, those forces are, are always there. Um, I don't have an answer as to how, how to overcome such forces. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just, I just speak as a historian. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes sir. You talk about increasing productivity as a, as a way of getting out of this. We've shut down our manufacturing base. What, what, are, what do we do with that? Well, I mean, actually, one of, one of the interesting things that I made very brief allusion at, at the end, the last couple of years, when the price of oil went up, other countries' manufacturers have become much more expensive in the United States. We actually have had a small revival of manufacturing, uh, and I suspect that as oil continues to get more dear, things that left American shores are going to be coming back. Now, of course, there are other forms of productivity uh, besides manufacturing, but manufacturing is very important, and I think we're going to see, as manufacturing returns, they're going to be building new state-of-the-art plants 
so they'll be able to take advantage of some of the most efficient, most productive ways of manufacturing. Uh, that will be one thing. It is certainly my hope that we'll be able to develop other things in transportation, becoming more efficient, moving more people, greater distances for no more money. I mean, why is it that American railroads set all their speed records in the 1930s? The 1930s. Isn't it time to be great again? <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yes, sir. What effect does inefficiency in the commodity market of oil do on the price of bond kinds of oil? In other words, what? speculation. I, I, I'm sorry, I missed your last word. What I call inefficiency, meaning speculation in the world commodity market for oil. Okay, this, this is an issue that, that is much, uh, much debated, to be sure. Um, the problem is to, to try to speculate efficiently to drive up the price of oil is devilishly difficult. The world produces 74 million barrels of oil a day. The largest super tanker holds about 2 million barrels. So, you know, let's say you're Mr. Speculator and you buy up a large amount of the daily production, you stick it in these super tankers and just have it floating out in the sea. Well, okay, let's say you buy it all. 37 super tankers you fill. Well, okay, that's one day. How about the next day? 37 more. 10 days, 370 super tankers. Nobody has that kind of resources. You can have some speculation in futures contracts, which are not deliverable oil. Right. Uh, but the price of oil that we tend to look at the most, not impossible to do some speculation on. You can certainly do a short-term shock. The oil crisis of 1979, which started with the Iranian Revolution, seems, according to much later research, to have been worsened by some chicanery uh, by oil companies and others. So there was a cause, there was something at the core, and they, they made it worse. But even that shock had a limited um, period. Okay, thank you. Last question? Yes, ma'am. What about the oil crisis in the 19, early 1970s when there were the oil lines, yes, gas lines and so forth? Yes. What made that worse other than cutting off our supplies? Okay, well, okay, a number of things. This, let me try to compress a lot of history into a very small thing. Uh, it's a funny thing with the fall of, uh, of Colonel Gaddafi. Uh, I, oddly enough, I, I was in Libya. Uh, about 18 months ago. I didn't have anything to do with the rebellion, no blame me. But nobody wanted to mention how Gaddafi got in there in the first place. He took power in 1969 with about two dozen supporters. Uh, and this, this was basically green-lighted by the Nixon administration. The Nixon administration also messed up terribly the development of the Alaska oil pipeline, which was supposed to open in 1969-1970. It was Colonel Gaddafi who put pressure on Occidental Petroleum to force uh, them to pay more. When the other oil majors tried to protect Occidental Petroleum, Nixon threatened antitrust action. The Alaska pipeline, of course, did not open until later. The higher oil prices, as you would expect, normally stimulated development. And, of course, prices then fell in the 1980s. So that's a brief compression of the history of 1969 to 97. That's when oil prices really began to rise. There was, of course, the, the crisis in the winter of, of winter of 1973 with the Arab oil embargo. But people forget the prices had been rising greatly. 
before the Yom Kippur War. That's again sort of gotten blurred and conflated over the years. Okay, last question, sir. If then when the United States sort of gets behind alternative fuels such as uh, solar power, could there actually be a possibility, in your opinion, of uh, uh, such a glut of oil on the world uh, wide, on the world markets, that there is actually the possibility, maybe, of a worldwide depression, economic depression? Okay. And, uh, if, uh, so, uh, and if so, could there, uh, could there be some logical thinking in Washington to the effect of of never allowing that to happen. Well, I mean, when it comes to solar energy, what solar energy has been useful for at this point is generating electricity. A solar-powered car, such things do exist, but they're difficult at the moment. They're not attractive. They do not go at sufficient speeds. If ever a time comes when the American people are willing to ride the equivalent of golf course, golf carts on their highways, solar will be great. Solar doesn't really compete that much with oil. Solar would be competing with coal and natural gas. Natural gas is in a glut. It's in a huge glut. Prices have fallen so much Chesapeake Energy, for example, is on the brink of bankruptcy. Wells are being capped. Um, so the electricity is going to go on for a while. Uh, certainly one like to see renewable sources of some kind, but in a sense, it, it, it has to assume a whole change in lifestyle. So I'm afraid before I can ever talk about you know, oil being worthless, and in depression, we have to get to the point of solar-powered cars and trucks and all the rest. Thank you. It's the value of... <laughs> Another example, the value of studying history, because that is an interesting prism with which to examine so many things that affect us. I want to thank you very much for joining us. As is our custom, we have a small reception for our guests, and I look forward to seeing you again at future lectures. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>